And Father God, we, um, today we just, we just ask for your blessing upon your word. We ask for your blessing upon each one of us here, that we would just be able to draw closer to you. Lord God, that you would just be speaking to us uh, directly, uh, that we would hear your voice, your words, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just be teaching us what we need to know. And Lord, if it's things we already know but need to hear again, that those things would just be sinking into our hearts. And um, Lord, that we'd be able to walk away from here equipped um, and just walking closer with you and, and just ready, Lord, to serve you with our entire lives. So we give this morning to you. Lord, we just uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are moving very slowly through 1 Corinthians. We're not, even, we're not going to get through chapter 1 today, <laughs> um, but we're, we're, we're going to get a little bit closer than we were. Uh, in all of this, Paul is writing, as we've said now, he's writing to a still very young church, a very young group of believers in Corinth. Young meaning they have not known the Lord that long. It's all, all across the age spectrum, sure, but those who are just coming to a faith in Jesus Christ, those who are just coming to this knowledge that he has saved them. And as we said, in that, is it a church? It's a church that's growing very quickly and just enormously, but it's also one that is dividing deeply as it grows. And Paul is addressing a lot of that as we go through. It's drawing people in from a very corrupt city, very immoral city, and many people who were just brought up in an immoral upbringing. They didn't know any better. They, it was just what they were brought up in. And there were those, as they were joining this church, there were those attempting to mix in what they had been brought up in, and mixing in all manner of human philosophy and uh, false teaching, and they were trying to bring their own personal license in with them, which is a very different, different thing from liberty. They were bringing their own license into the church, things they wanted to bring in that don't belong in God's presence. In introducing this letter, it's been interesting to see how Paul has approached addressing all of these issues. You know, as opposed to saying, you foolish Corinthians, you're getting everything wrong, <laughs> the Holy Spirit led Paul to open things that open with things that just basically say in things that God has already given the church, and really to all the church around the world and throughout history, too. He opens with the work that Jesus has already completed on our behalf, which is such an important but incredibly overlooked structure to keep in mind as we move through this letter. It, it, he leads with what Jesus has already completed, and we will continue to return to that as we make our way through this letter, because our tendency... I don't know if you've ever noticed this in your own life. Our tendency is to approach each other or to approach our spouses or to approach our children, even our friends, our brothers and sisters here. Our tendency is to approach them in the voice of, you foolish Corinthians, here's everything that you're getting wrong. Our tendency in this Christian walk, even with ourselves, is to approach even our own hearts, our own lives, in the voice of, you foolish Corinthian, you foolish sinner, you are getting everything wrong. And as we've seen through these past few weeks, Paul approaches them very differently. He approaches them in grace, and he approaches them with grace. And this letter, as we've said, as we go through, it will be very confrontive. He's not going to beat around the bush on things. He'll get right after them. And by proxy, he'll get right after us in the way that we are walking our walk with Jesus. And we're going to really start seeing that in the text that we have before us today. And that will continue right on through the end of the letter. But in approaching with grace... In the way that he has opened things up here, we've been reminded of the depth of the meaning of the word. Because it's a word that we throw around too lightly, all too often. <laughs> it is so much more than just unmerited favor from God. I mean, that's an accurate description. That certainly describes grace, unmerited favor. It describes grace in the same way you can call a slice of pizza delicious, you know? It is that, but it's also not even close to the whole of it. It's not even close to defining the whole of what you're consuming. As we said last week, God's grace fully, it is the gift of his very nature to you. It is something you are absolutely and utterly incapable of producing on your own. God the Father has provided it, and only God the Father could provide it. And it is something that you are incapable of earning on your own. You cannot earn God's grace. God the Son earned it for you. He secured that grace for you. And it is something you are incapable of receiving on your own. And that's where God the Spirit, God the Spirit plants it within you and roots it down in your heart and grows it and manifests it in your life within you. 
Someone, somewhere along the way, and you're going to get tired of hearing this acronym, but it's just so, so appropriate for what it is. Someone boiled the entire idea of grace down to the acronym that winds up being incredibly appropriate to define the word. You've heard this from me before. It is not my thing, though. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's what grace is. It is truly, it is all of God's riches, all of them. He has withheld nothing from us when he gave his son. It is his mercy given to us, undeservedly, his mercy. It is his nature poured out on us abundantly. It is his presence dwelling in us intimately. And it is his fellowship opened up for us that we might commune with him. It is his will working through us. It is his protection covering over us in all things. It is his power coming to rest upon us. And it is his righteousness removing sin and guilt and shame from us. It is all of the riches of the living God of all of creation bought and secured by the life of his son at his son's expense. And it is given freely. It is freely offered to us, this grace. And Paul, in this letter, he led with that, as opposed to everything else that would follow, he led with that. And just the acknowledgement and the recognition before getting into the instruction and the correction, and it is just the basic acknowledgement of what God has already provided for us in measures that we cannot begin to comprehend. He didn't lead in all this. He didn't lead with, here is what you must do. He led with, Here's what God has already done for you. God is faithful. God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We closed with those words last week. And everything that follows through the remainder of the letter, it will echo that simple truth. God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If at any point, as we move through this letter, if at any point you start to become discouraged as we continue through, return to that one line right there. God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If at any point you begin to feel defeated as we move through, if at any point you begin to feel hopeless in any piece of your life, defeated or hopeless, whatever you stumble into, Whatever lack of perceived progression comes to the surface in your life, return to that line right there. God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the whole of this letter, as we keep saying, it will come down to that idea of lordship. Repeatedly, repeatedly, we are going to see that question, who is Lord in your life? Who is Lord over your heart? Just as a hint, the answer should be Jesus. And if it's not, that's when it's time to readdress. That's when it's time to re-examine. That's when it's time to get alone with him and figure out where it's going wrong. Our theme verse as we move through this book comes out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6, which says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When we do this in our lives, when we try to live our lives with any form of dual lordship, over our lives, to live with anyone or anything other than Jesus as Lord, or alongside of Jesus as Lord over any part of your life, that is the very definition of carnality. But to live continually pursuing and surrendering to Jesus as Lord, that is literally the spiritually minded life. That is where you will find life in peace. Having established all that, though, we're going to dive right in, starting in verse 10 in chapter 1. It says, now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
of all of the things that Paul is going to address in this letter, and there will be some major, major things to tackle ahead, the first thing that he addresses is division. The first thing that he addresses is just that divisiveness and that discord that tends to plague the church, even into today, very much so. There are contentions among you. The word contentions, literally, it is quarrels, strife among you. And again, as opposed to just coming in and dressing the church down with all of his apostolic authority, which Paul certainly had, he pleads with them instead. He pleads with them as their brother. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He hangs the plea in the same manner that he's put the entire introduction of the letter together. He hangs this plea on who Jesus is. Remember who our Lord is. There were these factions forming among the believers there in Corinth. And something to understand contextually speaking, when we talk about the church there in Corinth, there was no grand central meeting place for the church there. It was an enormous city, enormous city. And there were a lot of people who lived there and a lot of people who were coming to this faith in Jesus. And as such, they were meeting in houses. They were meeting in public hallways. Wherever they could find to gather a group of believers, they would meet there. And clearly, when you look at the church today, we do very much the same. Because there is no building big enough, even in this little tiny town, in this little valley, there is no building big enough to hold every believer in this community. And that's a tremendous blessing. And that is a tremendous truth that there are that many who believe in Jesus Christ there. We have a lot of brothers and sisters all around us serving and loving the same Lord. There is no need for competition among his church. Because as as much as there's no single building that can hold every single one of us, it's equally true that there's not a single church building in this valley that has every seat filled for every service. There's plenty of room. (laughs) No reason for competition. But there are so many good fellowships that adhere to this plea right here that he makes to them, that you all speak the same thing. That you all speak the same thing. The thing that he is calling them to speak is the Lord Jesus Christ. That alone, him alone. There's a tremendous brotherhood in this community between the pastors. You know, and between each of us, it boils down to basically two qualifiers, which are really one and the same. Do you teach the whole of the Bible? Do you teach it as the inerrant word of God? And do you preach the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you're going to teach the whole of the Bible, yes, you're definitely going to preach the Lord Jesus Christ because the whole of the Bible does speak to who Jesus is. It will speak to the same thing. Tremendous brotherhood among the pastors here. But in that, we all do things differently. There's not a single one of us that's the same. There's not a single church fellowship, church body that is the same. And the Lord isn't going to lead everyone to the same church in that. He won't. And the important question is, and wherever you go, the important question is, is this where the Lord is calling you to be? Have you sought the Lord? Is this where he wants you to be? Because that's where you need to be. Wherever he has called you, wherever he has led you, be there and serve there. But seek his leading. Lord, do you want me here? And he'll let you know. He will absolutely let you know. We are all believers in the same Lord, but we meet in different places. God just brings together these smaller family subsets within his greater body, within the greater body of Jesus Christ. And that's a natural thing. It's a good thing. It's an important thing. It mimics the very idea of a body, you know? (laughs) Each organ functions differently. Each organ looks different and has a different function and a different calling in, in when it's been placed. Each organ is made up differently, different material, different, different pieces, different parts. Each organ has a different role and a different fit, but it all works together as part of a greater whole, and it must work together as part of a greater whole. Ideally, we all answer to the same Lord. That's the way that it should be. And here, in this body, we follow as he leads the family that he has gathered here. But in Corinth, what was happening And what you still see happening way too often today, what was happening was that people were gathering under these different banners. They were grouping into these different factions. I follow Paul. You know, we know Paul. He was here. He brought the gospel to us. He planted the church here. He brought us a rich heritage in the gospel. I follow Paul. But the thing in that is, there were others who were saying they followed Apollos. Apollos had been to Corinth, too, after Paul had been there first. And Apollos, we know from Scripture, he was a man who was a terrific orator and just an incredible biblical scholar. He was a more polished speaker than Paul was, quite frankly. (laughs) I like Apollos. He's easier to listen to. 
He gets me thinking more. I follow Apollos. And then when they said, I follow Cephas, that word Cephas is the same word that is used for Peter. I follow Peter. I'm, I'm one of the original. I, I follow the original foundation of the church. We follow Peter. And what's interesting in that is there is no record whatsoever of Peter ever having gone to Corinth. No record. <laughs> it's possible that there were those in Corinth who had encountered Peter in their travels. But at this very point in time, as this letter is written, Peter's epistles had not been written. His epistles would come down the road quite a bit. <laughs> it's possible that there were those in Corinth who had been in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. You know, those who may have heard Peter's first sermon, and that would have been something to behold, you know, right as the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church there and the, the church truly came into being. You should have been there and heard that. You should have seen that. It was something. Peter was on fire that day, and then literal flames of fire started coming out over the believers there. It was amazing. I've never seen anything like it since, and I'd never seen anything like it before. I follow a guy like that. I follow Peter. <laughs> he actually walked with Jesus. I want to be with somebody who walked with Jesus, and that was going to last all of one generation, you know? I follow Peter. And then there were those who were saying, I follow Jesus, right? Which at its heart, that is a beautiful thing to say. And that's the thing, truly, that we should be pursuing with our lives, that we would follow Jesus with our lives. But the way it's presented here, in the voice that Paul is bringing here, it's presented, it seems to suggest that there were those saying this, I follow Jesus. They were saying this out of a self-righteousness and a pride. Like, they knew that that was the right answer, but they were really taking a whole lot of joy in being right, as compared to everyone else. You know, I'm better than you because I got the answer right. <laughs> And the thing is, is we can fall into that so easily in our lives. We can fall into that very thing so easily because we do have what's right in Jesus Christ. We've been given what is right in Jesus Christ. We hold everlasting, eternal truth in our hands. And that's never going to cease to be true. We have the truth in our hands. We have access to the wisdom of the living God. We have a wisdom that is beyond what this world is. We have what's right through no doing of our own. This is just what God has provided for us. But so often you see people, and maybe you do this in your own life. And full disclosure, I know, I know I do this in mine. I have done it many times in mine. Where because what you do have, because what you do have is right and what is true, you start to get prideful about it. You start to get arrogant about it when you talk about Jesus with the rest of the world. You start walking around with that gospel chip on your shoulder, right? Right? And what's tricky is that it is true and that it is right, but to proclaim it in pride, to proclaim it in arrogance, even in self-aggrandizement, in such a way that would belittle anyone else, that does not mirror the heart of our Lord. And they won't see our Lord when you proclaim it pridefully. It is the antithesis of the heart with which he died for the sins of the world. It's a tricky thing. You can be doing the right thing. You can be saying the right thing, but you can be doing it with the wrong heart. And eventually that wrong heart will come to the surface for everyone else to see. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 44, he said, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. When you do the right thing with the wrong heart, understand the wrong heart eventually will catch up. The wrong heart eventually will come to the surface. For out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. There were those in Corinth claiming a discipleship of Jesus. I follow Jesus, which is right and true. He is the one we should be following with our lives. But the implication in the greater context here is that they were boasting in this claim. They were taking joy in being right in this claim as, a, as, a, as compared with all their brethren being wrong. It was a claim that was based in the pride of self-righteousness rather than the humility of complete surrender. And in that, too, the people were still following after men. But in that case, it was themselves that they were following. <laughs> it was relayed in the manner of, look at me, I'm right. Look at me, I'm right, rather than look at him, he's right. Such a subtle shift 
that is so important. That's the thing. When the focus pulls away from Jesus Christ, even in the slightest, you know, when people begin to follow after anything or anyone that is not Jesus, it automatically begins to crack the foundations. And sometimes it takes quite some time for the whole thing to fall apart. But the structure is being damaged mortally. Ultimately, it will lead to division and to discord and to quarrels because we will never find anything that we can unite completely on except for Jesus Christ. He's the only thing we will ever find complete unity in. Paul pleads for them here that they would all speak the same thing, that there would be no divisions among you, that you would be perfectly joined together. And that's a fascinating phrase, perfectly joined together. The word there is katarizo. It is to complete thoroughly, or to repair, or to mend what has been broken, and to make perfect, or to perfect. And when Jesus encounters James and John at the very beginning of his ministry, when he calls them to follow him, he finds them mending their nets. You know that story, right? And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 21, Mark chapter 1, verses 19, the same account is made and the same word is used. And when we see that word mending their nets, that word mending, the same word is used for mending there that is used for perfectly joined together here. It's a word that speaks of amending such that the intended work may be restored to its full function. It speaks of having once been full, having once been whole, and then been broken and divided, and then being put back together again. And the paramount issue that was facing the believers there and continuing on even into today was the fact that the body of Jesus Christ was breaking itself apart. And in that, it was being rendered unable to do the work it was intended to do. And that's a tragedy. And that is the tragedy when it comes to division or discord. I mean, what's true is that if you tear a vital organ away from the body and leave the two things separate, the body and the vital organ, both the organ and the greater body are both mortally wounded. Neither one will survive. Neither one will make it. They don't work right without each other. They don't work right as they've been designed by our Lord. They can't function right when you just break a piece away and set it apart from the rest. To steal from a couple of weeks from now, we're going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Remember our theme verse in this whole book. To be carnally minded is death. And what we're going to see in chapter 3 is that we'll see that to have envy or strife or any division among you, that is the definition of being carnal. That is carnality. And at the base, that is true. You know, carnality will always lead to division of the body of Christ. It will always lead to the division of the body of Christ. Spiritual maturity, though, having a maturity in the Holy Spirit, that will always lead to unity in the body of Jesus Christ. Here in Corinth, the body of Christ was breaking itself apart. It was tearing itself apart, and amending needed to take place in order to restore its proper function. Be perfectly joined together. Be mended in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then a very blunt question is asked here, is Christ divided? And that word divided is actually a very graphic term that was used in the Greek. It is the word merizo. It is literally to part or to tear apart. It speaks of a violent tearing apart. What is being asked here, is Christ torn apart? Is he torn apart now? And the humble truth here, the excruciating truth here, is that he was torn apart, willingly. He was torn apart specifically to make you whole in him, to set you at one again, and to set you at one with God the Father, and to set you at one with himself, And certainly to set you at one with all of his people. He was torn apart for that unity. But what was happening here? And what Paul was challenging them with is effectively they are tearing parts of Jesus' body away. Parts of his church to form their own grotesque new organisms. Based in Jesus. Derived in Jesus. Yes, of the same body. But separated and cordoned off to be something else. To be something it wasn't intended to be. It's kind of like we got his hand. We got Jesus' hand, but we're going to put Paul's name on it. (laughs) 
We got Jesus' mouth. We took his mouth, but we put Apollos' name on it. And Paul calls him out on it. Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Was a single one of you baptized into the name of Paul? Of course not. The name of Paul or of Apollos or of Peter, any other name. There's no power in any other name. What a useless thing to base all of your hope, base all of your identity on the name of a man that is not Jesus. There's no power in any of those names. And yet so often we start to do this so subtly. We divide into camps amongst each other. We divide into camps behind human leaders, human speakers, human writers, human teachers who are just instruments in the hand of our Lord. That's all they meant to be. That's all they're trying to be is just instruments in the hand of God. We separate pieces of his body unto ourselves and then try to plant the flag of some other teacher's name in his flesh. And that's a grotesque thing to do. In all of this, Peter and Paul and Apollos, they hadn't done anything wrong here. They were just doing and going however the Lord called them to go and do. (laughs) But the people had begun to section themselves off behind the banners of different men. When in Jesus, what's true is that we are called to unite wholly under his banner, and no one else's. His banner is the one that has the power. His body was not broken on our behalf that we might go back in and break him apart again into our own preferred sections. That's not why he broke himself apart for us. His body was broken to make us whole. His body was broken to make you whole. God help us if we start to lose sight of that basic truth. His body was broken specifically that you would be made whole, not that you might divide further. In verse 14, it says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect." Just a subtle reminder in this, baptism is a good thing, (laughs) it's an important thing, but it is not a necessity for salvation. If it were, it would render this entire section right here just nonsense. This section right here would not make sense if baptism were necessary for salvation, because what Paul would be saying here is, I thank God that I was unable to complete the salvation of any of you, except for Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus. Paul wouldn't say that. He wouldn't be thankful for that. His desire was that people would be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't be happy that he had been only able to convert three three households. (laughs) And baptism is simply an outward expression of the inward work that Jesus does in your own life. And it's a beautiful thing to do. It is a public proclamation that shows what the work that Jesus has done in your heart, shows what it is. But it is not what saves you. And if it were, I mean, what in the world would we do with the thief on the cross? Because they certainly didn't pull him down from the cross and baptize him and hang him back up there. And Jesus made a specific promise to him. Today you will be with me in paradise. And in that one promise alone, it proves to us it is Jesus' work on the cross alone. Offering a life for which there was no mark, no blemish for the sins of the world. It was him having risen from the grave in victory over death that gives us eternal life. It is his completed work that matters and only his completed work that matters. There is nothing you can do to earn or to deserve what he has done for you. You just accept it and you receive it. And Paul here, he's saying basically he's glad. I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you lest it become a further point of pride a further point of division among you, another reason to quarrel. You are made a part of the body of Christ, specifically to be a part of his body, to be a unified part of his body. That is why he has brought you in. You are not made a part of the body of Christ to mark off pieces of him for yourself, to take pieces away and call them your own. You are made a part of his whole body. You can't just start breaking off pieces for your own tribe, your own sect, or your own country even. In all of this, be made whole again with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Mend those nets. Mend those relationships. But understand, you cannot do that in your own effort. You cannot provide that mending in your own willpower, and your own patience, and your own strength. It's not going to happen. You mend through our Lord Jesus. I mean, tracking back to where we started today, this, place is, this plea is based entirely on who Jesus is 
and what Jesus has done. In the same mold, any mending that will occur between any one of us, it will be based, it must be based wholly on who Jesus is and on what he has done. The moment you try and make that unity happen, the moment you try and make that mending happen with even a shred of your own rights still at the heart of the matter, that's the moment that you will start to re-unravel. Whenever you leave any part of your own right in that mending, it'll begin to unravel automatically. Because you'll always be, be able to find a reason to not unite with somebody else. There will always be a reason. There will always be something they've done wrong or you've done wrong if you cannot just place only our Lord between the two of you. But it says here, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Such an important truth to really spend some time thinking over, that the gospel can stand on its own. The gospel can stand on its own, but we have been sent forth with a remarkable privilege in our lives. We have been sent forth with the privilege of preaching and sharing this gospel with the lost world. But in that, you don't have to dress it up. You don't have to make it more attractive. You can't make it more attractive. If you find yourself, as you share Jesus with anyone else, if you find yourself trying to reason them into the faith, if you try, find yourself trying to logic people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are in that moment, you are relying on the wisdom of your words instead of the power of the cross. Now think of it like this. If at any point in your life anybody has ever tried to set you up on a date, at some point it's probably happened, right? Anybody's tried to set you up on a date, they start by telling you all about the other person singing the other person's praises to you. They're going to be so great for you. You guys will be so good for each other. They'll tell you all the high points and hide all the low points, right? But they'll tell you all about why this is a perfect fit for you. They really want to make it work for you. They really want to make it work for the other person. They want you both to be happy. And when that happens, you can hear volumes about that person. You can know everything there is to know about that person. You can ask questions. You can talk to their friends. But until you actually encounter that person, until you actually meet them, until you can actually look them in the eye and see who they are in reality, there is nothing of any substance there. And there will be nothing of any substance there. And you can have all the knowledge in the world about them. You might even have a pretty good picture of them. But that picture, even then, that picture is just ink or pixels, you know? (laughs) None of it's going to mean anything without being presented with the reality of who that person is. Our God doesn't make it complicated on us when he calls us to share who his son is. He makes it uncomplicated specifically so that we don't lean on the wisdom of our words. Specifically so that a fool like me could tell somebody else about Jesus. He makes it uncomplicated. It is as simple as, have you met Jesus? Can I introduce you to Jesus? He knows you already. He loves you already. The cross of Jesus Christ has all of the effect. It should have all of the effect. It represents who our Lord is, like we keep saying, and it surely represents all of what he has done for you. You don't need to logic anyone into that. You don't have to. They already know there's a need in their lives. They already know the emptiness that they feel deep down. It's the same emptiness that you felt deep down. They know that something is missing. Just bring them to that cross. Bring them to that one who hung on that cross for them. Bring them to the one who defeated the grave for them. It doesn't have to be fancy. It certainly wasn't fancy as it happened. He speaks for himself. He speaks and he ministers to their heart. He is the one who will save them, not the wisdom of your words. Because the thing is, you can have a perfectly articulated perfectly reasoned approach to sharing Jesus with anyone, but where you have to be so careful in that, when it becomes about how well you present the gospel of Jesus Christ, where you have to be so careful is which part of the person are you trying to win with the wisdom of your words? Because you can win a person's mind. We see it all the time. There are people who take classes in manipulating a person's mind. The mind is manipulatable, And it's easily manipulated out of whatever it's been manipulated into. You can win a person's mind. Maybe you can win the debate in that moment. Maybe you can win the argument. But if their heart is not one to Jesus Christ, they are still bound for hell. Understand that. If their heart is not one to Jesus Christ, they are still bound for hell. 
Let that one thought color everything that you think when it comes to sharing our Lord with anyone else. You might win the argument. You might put on a pretty good show. We can have classes and workshops on how to debate the faith and how to stand for the faith, how to present a persuasive case, how to accurately articulate all the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We can spend a lot of time on how to, but if the heart is not one, if their heart is not one, nothing has changed for them. And it is the heart that needs to change. And only Jesus can change the heart. Only Jesus can change the heart. Just share him. There's nothing wrong with that. He can stand on his own. Share what he has done for you. Present the cross. Don't worry about the wisdom of words. Let the cross have all the power because it does have all of the power. We are sent to share the gospel with our words and with our lives. And you will never in your life, you will never speak more eloquent and more beautiful words and more powerful words than the simple and the pure love of Jesus Christ. And that is the heart of the greater point that's being presented here. Within the body of Christ, it is Christ's body that binds us together. Within his body, it is his body that unites us. When we start cordoning off for ourselves, when we start separating, when we are breaking him apart, we are breaking apart what was offered specifically to unite his people. We are using his body in a way that it was not intended to be used. And that thought, and take a moment this week, take a moment today, figure out your quarrels. Figure out your contentions with your brothers and your sisters. Find a way to get there. And give it all over into his hands. I heard Joe Foch say something this week. He was only half joking as he said it, but I'm going to carry this with me for quite a while. If you need to be right in your relationships with your brothers and sisters, if you need to be seen as right in whatever you're dealing with, in whoever you're dealing with, if that's the most important thing going on for you right now, that you are right, we'll get you a t-shirt. I was right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, this is so profound, he said, there are much higher things in the kingdom of heaven than right and wrong. Jesus was right, and we were wrong. And yet he laid down his life for us. And he laid down his life for us in our wrongness that we might be made right. That is the heart of our Lord. That's the heart of the one that we follow. And the truth is that this heart, the heart of the gospel, it is beyond worldly wisdom, far beyond worldly wisdom. It is beyond our understanding of right and wrong because it runs contrary to our basic nature. There's a power in that gospel that we cannot explain. The cross of Jesus Christ has great effect, even on its own. It speaks a truth, and it conveys a power entirely outside of the wisdom of this world. And at its heart, that message, that gospel message, it comes down to one laying down their life for another, that the other might be made right, specifically so that there might be unity, that there might be that perfect mending within his body that was broken first for you. That's the pattern of our Lord. When we talk about following in his pattern, it must also be in the pattern of his church. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. He left us an example specifically so that we would follow the example that he left us. It's a verse that we gladly abide by. You know, it's a verse that we gladly pursue when it comes to striving to live as he lived. We like that, following after the example that he lived for us in his life, but we really struggle with it when it comes to dying as he died. <laughs> it's a truth that we really struggle with, if not discard it completely, when it comes down to laying down our rights. When it comes down to laying down our right when we have been wronged, and consider this, in whatever wrong has been enacted against you, in whatever wrong has occurred in your life, has not our Lord been right alongside you through the entirety of it as it happened? Is he not with you in it, even right now? Has he not sustained you? Has he not provided for you through the entirety of whatever that wrong has been? 
I have the words that we sing in that song, you brought me this far, you brought me this far. Have those words ever ceased to be true? Will they ever cease to be true? No. And yet you were wrong. All of us were wrong. Jesus was right. He is right today, and he laid down his life in order to restore fellowship for you, and in order to have communion with you, and in order to make your life right before God. He laid down his right in your wrong. What is he calling on you to do in your life today? What's he calling on you to lay down? That separation between believers, that brokenness between believers, only, only bad things can grow in that space of brokenness and separation. Envy, bitterness, anger, and pride, hate, only bad things can grow in that space. And in that, as long as that divide, that, as long as that chasm is left wide open, our Lord will not be able to fully do the work that he intends to do in your life as long as you leave that divide open. He will not be able to do the work he intends to do through your life until that chasm has been mended, and he can mend it today, but only he can mend it, okay? <laughs> as we've said many, many times now, forgiveness and reconciliation, they are two very different things. They are two different things. There can be forgiveness without restoration. There can be forgiveness without reconciliation. Reconciliation and restoration, those demand true repentance from both sides for it to be genuine. And that's the ideal. That's the ideal, to have a real restoration, to have a real reconciliation. But the sad truth is it just doesn't always unfold that way. Forgiveness, though, all forgiveness takes is you. You and our Lord who provided it first. But all it takes is you. In repentance, all that takes is you. All that takes is you. If someone has wronged you, forgive. Forgive. If you really need it, we'll get you a shirt. I was right. <laughs> if you have wronged someone else, repent. And if you're feeling left out of the shirts, we'll get you one too. I was wrong, but I've been made right. Okay? And just to be, we're, nobody's getting any shirts, okay? <laughs> just, nobody would wear that shirt. Nobody would wear the I was right shirt because you'd feel silly, right? But understand in that, this is so important to understand, as much as you wouldn't wear the I was right shirt, when you wear I was right in your heart, when you wear that attitude in your life, you look silly and everyone can see it. Get away from right and wrong. <laughs> the gospel, there's no other way to present it than to just simply say Jesus is real he really died, he really rose again, and he did this to account for your sin and to free you from your sin, from your wrong, and to deliver you from your sin. And accepting that truth, and more specifically, accepting Jesus as the Redeemer and the Lord over your life, it will change your entire life. It will change your entire life. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Taste and see. I challenge you. He is good. I don't have to sell you on him. <laughs> he is good. He is faithful. Taste and see for yourself. But accepting him, when you do receive him, when you do accept him, that makes you a part of his body. That is a truth that you cannot escape when you've accepted him as Lord over your life. It makes you a part of his body, and his body was broken so that we all might be made whole in him. It's time to stop separating out. It's time to stop breaking off pieces for yourself. It's time to stop tearing him apart to suit our different quirks and to suit our different grudges, to suit our different contentions with each other. In him, our lives are not our own anymore. You have to understand that piece. Our lives are not our own anymore. They belong to him. And as it states in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, he is joining us and he is knitting us all together specifically so that we might be of use together in his hands. So let him do that. And stop tearing away. Let him just join and knit and mend. It's a beautiful thing when we let him do that. <laughs> That's all we got for this week. Go ahead and read ahead. Like I said, it's going to be a couple more weeks before we return to this book. But read ahead. See what the Lord's got there. It's good stuff.
Well, Father God, this morning we just, we, we set our lives before you. And Lord, so many times we try and pick them back up for ourselves, and for the things that we want to do and the things that we feel we should be doing, Lord. And so often we miss your heart. And we miss your perfect will. And Lord, today we just, we, we want to surrender back over to you. We want to give you the whole of who we are. And in that, Lord, we want to give you our hurts and we want to give you the wrongs that have been enacted against us. And Lord, we just, we want to live in your rightness, in your righteousness. And Lord, we just, we want to be yours. We want to live in the grace that you have provided and be able to extend and share the grace that you have provided to us. So, Lord, we just ask that you be drawing us close this week. We ask for your shelter, for your protection as we move forward. Lord, we just ask for your provision. And that in each moment that you give us, that you just be showing us how you are working in each one of our lives. And Lord, that you'd be giving us the words that we need and the wisdom that we desire and just allowing us, Lord, to do exactly as you would have us do. We just are grateful and thankful for who you are and for what you continue to do and for the way that you challenge us, Lord, but in such patience. And just, Lord, always you bring your grace before us in order to shape us more into the image of your Son. So we thank you for that, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.